Hi everyone, great to be with you. I'm going to be talking to you about uh, three key things in the next 15 minutes. I'm going to touch on the carbon neutral 2030 roadmap for industry, a little bit around progress to date and, uh, and the path ahead, and then leave the producers in the audience with some actions for today and some insights for tomorrow. Next slide, thank you. Uh, Mick mentioned this earlier, but the Australian Red Meat Industries Red Meat 2030 strategy, which was released by RMAC, um, sets the vision of doubling the value of Australian red meat sales as the trusted source of the highest quality protein. Um, this will be achieved by focusing on product quality and, and key aspects of the industry, which are important to consumer and community trust, um, including animal wellbeing and environmental stewardship. MLA is, uh, is identifying opportunities to generate and capture value for producers through environmental service provision alongside red meat production. That's alongside red meat production, not in place of red meat production. And this includes low carbon and carbon neutral livestock production systems. MLA alongside our partner RDCs, AMPC and LiveCorp, Plus, multiple stakeholders are investing in technologies and practices to help industry achieve the carbon neutral 2030 target. In 2017, the industry um, launched the carbon neutral 2030 initiative with the ambition of achieving net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. That's net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. And this means that by 2030, Australian beef lamb and goat production, lot feeding and processing value segments will make no net release of greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere. And progress is reported uh, by the federal government's National Greenhouse Gas Inventory and each year MLA commissions CSIRO to construct uh, the carbon neutral 2030 account for the Australian red meat industry. Next slide please. Uh, so in 2020, MLA released the Carbon Neutral 2030 Roadmap because in 2017, the, the foundational research was done that could show that uh, the industry could achieve a, a net zero position. But we recognised that um, we needed to table a document that described what a carbon neutral industry looks like and how we might get there in the future. Um, and so we come up with three or four key work areas under the roadmap. And not surprisingly, first and foremost, we start with investing in our people. It's investing in producers, farm advisors, industry leaders, MLA's own staff to ensure that we have the knowledge and understanding uh, to operate in what is a complex environment that is climate science as well as red meat value chains. Uh, the next two work areas are technology focused, where a lot of the action happens. So. First and foremost, we're focusing on emissions avoidance um, in grazing properties, feedlots and processing facilities. And that's focusing in on technologies like genetics technologies that reduce methane emissions per unit of product, feed additives um, like red asparagopsis or 3NOP, as well as forages and legumes, so deep-rooted deep perennial and, and digestible uh, pastures, as well as tropical legumes like lachina and desmanthus which have methane inhibiting properties. Thinking about processing facilities, that's energy efficiency technologies that um, reduces fossil fuel use through to covering um, waste processes and extracting biogas um, to re re prevent methane loss in the atmosphere and generate energy on site. To help us get there under this area of emissions avoidance, we've recognising that um, we can't achieve our outcome alone and forming partnerships is mission critical to, uh, to, to significant change program in the industry. And so we have formed an emissions avoidance partnership comprising more than a dozen partners. Um, some of Australia's best research organisations, CSIRO, some of the country's best universities, multiple state government organisations and private enterprise with great ideas and technologies uh, for the industry. And so we spent a number of years forming a partnership um, which has been running to ground as we speak and getting off the ground and that will see investment in the order of 40 million dollars out to 2025 developing really promising technologies and adoption programs for industry 
On the other side of the equation, um, we also need to be promoting carbon storage in a productive way for the industry. And that's going to occur in, in grazing properties. Um, but selecting vegetation that enables multiple benefits is mission critical, whether that's a tree for shade and shelter, um, as well as carbon benefit and biodiversity benefit, or whether it's making use of available vegetation to retain the carbon store again for multiple benefits for the animal and for the landscape and for the environment. And so we've also formed a carbon storage partnership that's going to be looking at developing and deploying new, new vegetation species um, for, for the, the, the livestock sector in Australia. And we've already seen around $20 million of, of partnership formation in that area, which is being led out of the University of Tasmania, but has natural reach with some really great partners across the country. The fourth work area is an area that brings together the outputs of the emissions avoidance and carbon storage area, but, but enables reporting um, and measurement reporting verification such that we can track progress over time and producers can have farm management tools that enable them to measure and verify and report their change over time to meet current and future market requirements in this area. And so we're calling that the integrated management systems area where we integrate the output of emissions avoidance and carbon storage into a measurement and reporting platform. We're also uh, supporting the development of um, measurement methodologies that enable producers to, to generate carbon credits using some of these promising technologies like feed additives. And we know that if we do these things really well in these four areas, we are going to unlock uh, multiple benefits to the industry in the form of demonstrated environmental stewardship, uh, increased profitability and increased animal productivity. Next slide, please. A little bit about um, progress to date. Um, it's, it's really important to note that total net greenhouse gas emissions attributed to the red meat sector is around 55 million tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent emissions or around 10% of the country's um, national accounts. Now that's using um, the Australian Federal Government's GWP100 greenhouse gas accounting metric. It's extraordinary to think that the Australian red meat industry has more than halved emissions uh, since 2005 from around 120 million tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent down to around that 50 million tonnes. There's no other sector in the economy that has demonstrated that progress over time. But the reduction in net emissions has been achieved primarily through reductions in land clearing plus um, regeneration of woody vegetation. However, at the same time, continued improvements in production efficiency have reduced methane emissions per unit of product, demonstrating that the industry can remain productive whilst reducing net emissions. The industry can remain productive and profitable whilst reducing net emissions. It's also important to note that because of geological, topographic and climatic factors, less than 8% of Australia's land is suitable for crop production. Less than 8% of Australian land is suitable for crop production. That's a fundamental point when considering land use options in Australia. For the most part, Australia is a hot and dry landscape, which limits land use options in the majority of locations. One of those options is ruminant agriculture, because by design, ruminants can eat and convert plants that grow in areas where crops cannot into protein for human consumption, in addition to the myriad of other products um, in non-meat markets. That's why around 355 million hectares, or around a half of Australia's land mass, or nearly 90% of agricultural land is used for grazing livestock. This means that the red meat industry controls large tracts of land that offers a carbon storage solution for Australia if managed correct, correctly, using contemporary technologies and practices that deliver productivity-led reductions in emissions and improvements in carbon storage over dec decadal timeframes. Now, if we apply all these things well, we can limit industry's contribution to temperature rise without requiring any adjustment to livestock numbers. And in fact, industry has the capacity to future, uh, to, for future productivity growth whilst meeting global temperature targets under the Paris Agreement. 
And that is significant for the Australian red meat industry when we trade in a global meat market. Australian sheep reproduction is not causing additional temperature rise and beef isn't far behind. Um, and the emissions avoidance and carbon storage partnerships formed recently will enable producers to capitalise on market opportunities for low carbon and carbon neutral products today and into the future. Next slide, please. A little bit on the path ahead um, and key milestones to achieve CN30. In 2020, industry the, or MLA and our partners released the next generation carbon accounting tools for producers, which is available on MLA website. We also started to pilot some carbon neutral extension adoption packages for producers, which will see the launch of the first carbon edge package for producers later this year or early next. As we get out to 2023, we'd be looking to see technologies become available for the sector to use and of, of uh, a lot of interest to producers and stakeholders nationally, internationally have been some of the emerging livestock feed supplements, which we'll see hit feedlots and dairies uh, in the coming years. At the same time, whilst these technologies are coming to market, it's fundamentally important that the industry is recognised for the environmental benefit created through its use. And to do that, we need scientific methods. That, that, that tell producers very simply that if this technology is used in this particular way, for example, a feed additive is fed using this particular method, that a certain amount of carbon credits can be generated by that producer and therefore trade it in the market, whether it's attached to a red meat product they supply to a value chain or whether they choose to sell the carbon credit into a voluntary market. As we get out to 2025, we'd expect to see large scale uptake of savannah fire management methods in Northern Australia. It's already a significant part of operating Northern Australian partial enterprises. However, our insights are that there could be up to 40 million hectares of Northern Australian land used for savannah fire me management methods, creating in excess of 10 million additional carbon credits a year for the sector. As we get out to 2030, this is where we'd be looking to see some significant uptake uh, and adoption of some promising technologies. So for example, tropical legumes, um, where it could be as many as 25 million hectares of new legume plantings established by producers, increasing livestock productivity substantially and reducing livestock methane emissions along the way. Supplements being used um, in the vast majority of feedlots and even in some supplementary feeding programs in extensive arrangements that increase live weight gain by up to 10% and decrease enteric methane by up to 90%. Um, and we could expect to see them used in potentially 40% of the national herd and even 75% of feedlots. Uh, producers using vegetation management methods would be um, something that becomes largely main mainstream. Um, and by using those methods can achieve multiple benefits. And we would anticipate that majority of revegetation activities would be occurring in Southern Australia. And it could be as much as 10 million hectares um, of the available 30, 355 million hectares nationally, but with a, with a Southern Australian focus. Um, and so you can see there's some really large adoption targets there, but in the interest of time, I'm going to keep moving on. Next slide, please. I also wanted to leave you now with 10 things producers can do today, and that will set us up nicely um, uh, for, for discussion in Q&A. The first thing is to arm yourself with the right knowledge. There's lots of information available now on MLA's website, including uh, tools that can help you develop a carbon account. Um, so you need to know where you are before you can make decisions on what might what the future might hold. Once you've completed that, you can be considering herd and flock management practices that um, are good practice, techno um, pra good practice things to do to improve live like gain per unit of product um, or, and per unit of methane emissions produced. And so there's some links there which we can you can access um, in, in your own time on our website. Things like the beef cattle herd management fact sheet um, that, sh that talk you through practices uh, that deliver those outcomes. You should consider energy efficiency, renewable energy technologies that ultimately reduce carbon dioxide emissions from fossil fuel use on farm. Identify shade and shelter options on farm, which is also important for multiple benefits, um, including selecting the right tree and the vegetation species for your region. 
Um, the other insight that we have for you is around um, you looking at potential Savannah fire management methods, particularly with Northern Australian focus. Next slide, please. Monitoring and recording active dung beetle populations um, on farm, planning for the delivery and distribution of new feeds and supplements, whether you're in a feedlot or um, in extensive grazing arrangement, establishing deep rooted uh, palatable pastures and legumes that promote carbon storage into soils in particular. Um, consider what mix of pastures, legumes and trees are appropriate for your farm and your region and look at collaborative supply chain arrangements where groups of producers come together to increase supply of product, but even down the value chain, connecting producers with brand owners looking to make claims in this area. Next slide, please. So leave you with a few insights um, on some work that's emerged from MLA programs. Consumers are the driving force behind sustainability action. Brands are the driving force behind carbon neutrality. So the consumers are looking for action but it's the brands who are driving carbon neutrality movement. Any approach to carbon neutrality can be used by a brand. The so consumers are less concerned about how an outcome is achieved, more concerned about um, the attribute that's on a pack has been assessed by a, a suitably qualified process and therefore is verified as being true. Brands require certification for consumers to buy in, um, and MLA supported market research has revealed that one in four consumers would be willing to pay 15% more for a carbon neutral red meat option. And on the right hand side there, you can see a markup of an example of a, a product um, with a logo attached um, communicating that claim to a consumer. And the next slide please. So in summary, I just want to leave you with some key um, benefits for, for industry in engaging in this area. Maintaining consumer and community support for the industry, gaining market access to high value markets, particularly in Europe, um, in North America, maintaining access to capital, but also enabling access to growth capital to enable your business to grow in the future. Um, avoiding less blunt regulation where governments intervene due to lack of industry action in this area. And through the use of the right technologies and practices, um, we can enable more productive land, animals and people in the industry, which means increased revenue and maintaining our position as the trusted source of the highest quality protein. Next slide, please. So in summary, industry has made great progress and is well positioned to take advantage of future markets for climate friendly red meat products. Production driven reductions in livestock methane emissions is the key challenge ahead for us to achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions. The Carbon Neutral 2030 roadmap shows the way, so I encourage you to check it out um, and certainly provide feedback to, to NLA around the roadmap um, and, and the pathways described. And multiple benefits are on offer when the right technology is applied, but there's no silver bullet, more bullet for industry. So we are placing multiple bets to deliver a cumulative outcome. In 2030, can you imagine that consumers buy Australian red meat knowing it's good for the environment and it's good for them?